the coming year, uh, people make resolutions. I don't know if you've made resolutions. My wife and I have resolved that we're going to eat better this year. Uh, it's always in the back of my mind. I always want to think, well, I want to grow in the Lord this year. So we're always making resolutions. What is it about resolutions that is so attractive at the beginning of the new year? Well, it's because we want to change. You know, we look at our life and we say, well, I, I really want to be a better person. Uh, here's some interesting facts about New Year's resolutions. I'll look these up. The most common resolution made is not actually to diet, as you would probably think. It's to increase the amount of exercise that one gets. Uh, it's estimated that 37% of all resolutions are to get more exercise. Anybody made that resolution, more exercise? Nobody in here? Okay. Uh, unfortunately, about 22% of all resolutions fail in the first week. One weekend, people give up. Uh, after a month, 40% of all resolutions have failed. Then after three months, half of all the resolutions made have, have fallen through. And then after six months, 60% of all resolutions have failed. Uh, the most popular resolutions of 2017, I don't know if you thought about this or not, but the most popular, the four most popular resolutions of the year, and these are true in Australia, uh, first of all is to be a nicer person. We could use that in this country, in this culture, I think. <laughs> The second one on the list was to save more money. And then third on the list is get a new career. But this one may not surprise you, or it may, I don't know. The fourth one on the list, most popular resolution for 2017 in this country, cut down on drinking. Does that, does that surprise anybody? Just turn on the television and see how many commercials are about alcohol and drinking. But the most commonly broken resolution of all of these, what would you guess? The first one. It's exercise. That's right. The most common resolution made is to exercise, and that's the most commonly broken. Well, you know, God has made promises to you and I as believers. Uh, resolution is all about change. It's about bettering ourselves. It's about changing who we are for the better. Well, God has made some resolutions, per se, in Scripture. Uh, but the difference between God and you and I is where we may break our resolutions, we may break our promises to ourselves. Uh, God doesn't do that. When God makes a promise to you and I, uh, He keeps His Word. I want to give you three, three things in Scripture, and there's more than three, but I want to limit it to three tonight. Uh, three things that God promises to you and I as believers uh, regarding change. And the first one is found in Jeremiah 24, verse 7. I'll give you a moment to make your way over there. Jeremiah 24, 7. The Bible states this, And I will give them in heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return unto me with their whole heart. Did you catch, did you catch there what uh, God has promised to you and I as a believer? Well, well let me make this clear first of all, that uh, Jeremiah, the Bible here is talking about God's people, the Jews, the Israelites. But let me also make it clear that Scripture says that as believers, we've been grafted into the vine of God's people. So when we read a promise to God's people in the Old Testament, we can take that to the bank and apply it to you and I. Because if we're believers in Christ tonight, we've been grafted into the vine of God's people. And God here has promised that He will give us a heart to know Him. He's promised a new heart. Uh, basically, He's promised you and I a heart transplant. Um, I heard a story not... Well, it's been a while, actually. I don't know if it's true or not. 
probably is, there was a Sunday school teacher who implored one of his students, a little child, to give his heart to the Lord. And the child began to cry. He wanted to, but he started to cry. And the Sunday school teacher said, well, what's the matter? Don't you want to give your heart to the Lord? And he said, I want to, but will it hurt when the, sur when the surgeon takes it out? <laughs> you see, when the Bible talks about, about our heart, uh, it's referring to our self-will, our will. That's what the Bible talks about. The heart is synonymous in Scripture with our self-will. And God has promised that He will give us a will or a heart transplant. Um, Disney movies ad nauseum. I don't really watch them anymore, but I've seen quite a few. And one of the running themes in the Disney movies is follow your heart. Your heart will never lead you astray, right? That's the doctrine of Disney. I read a column in a, in a newspaper, an American newspaper called the Huffington Post. I don't know if you've heard of that one before. Um, it's an it's a, a anonymous columnist who writes this about the heart. Uh, he says, or she, when you follow your heart, you cease having regrets. Obviously, they've not read Scripture. Well, this person goes on to say, listen to your heart. It knows your true desires. To end, I find it important to highlight the concept of listening to your heart because it knows your true desires. Well, there may be some truth in that. It knows your wants and needs and what will genuinely make you fulfilled. When we are honest with ourselves, when we are willing to ask ourselves what is truly in our hearts, we can open up ourselves to possibilities. The possibility to fulfill our heart's desire and to be who we were truly meant to be, doing what we were meant to do. Uh, well, doesn't Jeremiah 17.9 say the heart is uh, deceitful above all things and desperately wicked? Who can know it? Uh, you know, there's the doctrine of Disney and the doctrine of man, and then there's Scripture. Uh, the old heart has some problems. The old self-will has problems. Uh, number one, in our old nature, we are opposed to God. You look at, the, you look at people going up and down the street. They look nice enough. I see somebody walking down the footpath there. They look nice enough. Uh, the old lady pushing the trolley down the aisle at the supermarket, she's probably nice enough. But the Bible says that if she has not been regenerated, if she has not received Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, she is still unregenerate and still in her old nature, opposed to the Lord. You know what the old will, the old heart does? Um, it desires to satisfy the flesh. I mean, honestly, that's what the old heart does. It desires to satisfy the flesh. Well, what is the flesh, you might ask? Uh, that's, that's another one of those terms that we assume everybody knows what the Bible is referring to. In nine, in nine instances in the New Testament, the flesh is equated with lust. Well, let me give you an example in 1 Peter 4, verse 2. It says that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. I was talking about the person who has that relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Uh, that person is no longer to live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men. So the old nature, the old heart, uh, is opposed to God because it desires to satisfy the lust of the flesh. Uh, well, once again, what do I mean by lust? Uh, Galatians 6, verse 8 says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit of... I'm sorry, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap everlasting life. Lust is that which is not of the Spirit. It is that that reaps corruption. Uh, certainly when we think of lust, we can think of... Uh, improper sexual relations, fornication. Uh, we can lust after 
material things. We can lust after things in our lives that God doesn't want there. Lust itself is anything that is opposed to the Lord's will for your life. That's what the old heart seeks, is to fulfill those lustful desires that are opposed to God. Here's another problem with the old unregenerate heart. Um, it puts one's self before God. Uh, well, let me, let me back up. It puts the self before other people. Now, people will say, I'm a nice person. I think about others. Uh, but honestly, people looking, walking up and down the street are thinking about themselves. They, they're saying, I'm number one. It's all about me. Uh, it violates the most fundamental rule of God. The Bible says in Matthew 22, verse 37 to 40, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. This is the first and great commandment. But there's another one that's equal to that because Jesus says, And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Uh, we are to love our neighbors as much as we love God. Who is our neighbor? It's anybody else that's not me. Um, you see, in my old nature, I say it's all about me. I take care of myself first, and then everybody else comes second. You know, if I see somebody in need, I think, well, I can't help them because I've got to take care of myself. Um, Jennifer and I were, when Bethany was in the car, I think, we were trying to decide where we were when this happened. I think it was Christmas Day, we were headed to the Bramblet's house. We are going down the motorway, and Jennifer's driving. She goes into the passing lane to overtake a car, and she wasn't going fast enough. And so there was a car behind us that just felt like they needed to push us out of the way. So she gets back over into the other lane and the passenger lady in that car just glared at us. Just stared daggers in us because we got in their way. That was their lane and we didn't belong there. It was all about them. We see it on the roads. We see it in people's attitudes. Um, it's all about me. I mean, am I wrong here? If we live in a culture that's just about me. That's the old regenerate heart. And it's opposed to the will of God. It's opposed to Scripture that says that we are supposed to not just put our neighbors uh, on the same level as us, but I would dare say we put them on the level higher than us. We sacrifice for other people. The old heart puts self before God. Romans 9, verse 20 to 21 says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hast not the potter power over the clay? It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. God made you. God breathed life into every living being on this earth. And for that very reason, every person owes it to the Lord to recognize Him as authority over their life. And when we choose not to do that, it's as if we're saying, why did you make me this way? You don't have, you're the potter, but you don't have power over me. I'm just the clay. That's what the old will does. It removes God's authority over one's life, and that person says, I'm my own authority. I'll do what I want to do. Um, I don't want to go any further with that because I could offend some people wrongly, so I'll just leave it at that. Um, but there are some results of a new regenerate heart. There is some good news here. Because when God takes out that old nature, that old heart, that old self-will, He doesn't leave a void. He puts something else in its place. He puts a new will in the life of the believer. If you're a child of God tonight, do you know that you have a will, a heart, that wasn't there before? Uh, God doesn't just take what's there and change it. He replaces it so that your will is no longer your old will, but the will of, the God, will of God. You no longer care about those things that, uh, that you strove after before you became a child of God. 
God has now put in you a, a, a will that seeks after His, that lines up, that dovetails with His will. He's given you a new set of desires. Psalm 37.4 says, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and He shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Uh, it's not saying that if you delight yourself in the Lord, that he's, He'll give you whatever you want. That, that if you just ask for something, name it, claim it, God will give it to you. That's been a misused and abused passage. Um, what the psalmist here is saying is that as you delight yourself in the Lord, He will remove those old desires that don't belong, the old heart, and He will, as He puts a new will, a new desire in your heart, He will give you the desires that line up with His. So you no longer desire those old things, the lust of the flesh, those things which reap corruption. But now your desires line up with those things that line up with His desires. Your will becomes His will. Your will becomes His desire. A new heart. Secondly, and we find this in 2 Corinthians 5.17, The Bible says, uh, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What was the new here? A new creature. Uh, once again, the Bible doesn't say here that uh, if you're in Christ, that that you're the same person, but, that, but you've been transformed into something different. The Bible says that you are a new creature. The old man is gone. The, the new man is who you are. In another part of the Bible, in another passage, Paul puts it this way. It's like taking off an old garment, taking off the old man, casting it aside, putting on the old man, or the new man, putting on a new garment. That's who we become in Christ is a new creature. It's a product of the Holy Spirit's divine intervention. You know, we can't be a new creature without the help of the Holy Spirit. We just can't do it. People have tried. People think that they can put on a show of religion and they can do good works and make people think that they're somebody, but they're really not. They're not fooling God. The Bible makes it clear that uh, we need the help of the Holy Spirit in our lives to become this new creature. Without the Holy Spirit, we're just the old person. Uh, we're a charlatan in disguise. Ephesians 1.13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. So once you've been saved, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Bible makes it very clear that once we become a child of God through Jesus Christ, we have the Holy Spirit. We don't need to speak in tongues to prove that. Uh, we don't have to have faith healing services to prove that we're Christians. The Bible makes it clear the qualification for having the Holy Spirit is that we've trusted, heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and that we believed. Very simple. And we have the help of the Holy Spirit. Here's, here's what the Holy Spirit does for you and I. Number one, it gives us a new mindset. And this is something we need the help of the Holy Spirit working in us to give us a new mindset. Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit replaces pride with humility. As, as He gives us a new mindset, uh, He's at work replacing that pride with the humility of Christ. You know, if there was a humble person ever on this earth, we think of Moses, right? It was Jesus Christ. He was probably the most humble human being that ever lived on this earth. And the Holy Spirit's at work giving us that mindset. Do you have pride in your life? Perhaps the Holy Spirit is not able to work in you as, as it should. Compassion. You know, there used to be 
uh, at once in our lives. There used to be apathy, unconcern. We don't care about others. We just compare. We just care about ourselves. But the Holy Spirit working in us, giving us this new mindset, replaces that uh, attitude with compassion. What is compassion? Concern for the sufferings and misfortunes of others. Aren't you glad tonight that Jesus Christ had compassion on you and I? That He came down from heaven to earth, lived the life of a humble servant because He cared and loved for you and I enough to not see us suffer and die in hell. We should strive for that same compassion. The Holy Spirit replaces uh, vengeance with long-suffering. Don't we want to get even with people when they do us wrong? It's human nature. Uh, just because we're Christians doesn't mean we're immune to this. If somebody does you wrong, you want to get even with them. Well, aren't you glad tonight that God didn't get even with you and I? <laughs> We wouldn't last very long. The Bible says God Himself is long-suffering. The Bible says that even though we wrong Him time and time again, He's patient with us. That's what long-suffering is. And the Holy Spirit working in our mind uh, replaces that attitude of vengeance with long-suffering. If God was long-suffering to us, then we should be long-suffering to other people. I mean, after all, the offenses that we have toward God have been forgiven. How much less should we forgive these minor offenses that people do to you and I? The Holy Spirit does this as well. It gives us knowledge. I would even say enlightenment. The Holy Spirit enlightens us in a way that cannot happen without His help. He gives us knowledge or enlightenment of the Word of God. Now, <clears throat> let me make this clear. I believe that an unbeliever who does not possess the Holy Spirit or is not possessed by the Holy Spirit can still read the Bible and they can still understand the gospel of salvation. God's Word is clear when it comes to the message of salvation. But when we become believers, and I've noticed this in my own life, and it still occurs on a daily basis as I read God's Word, I see things that I've read a hundred times that all of a sudden, I was like, wow, I didn't see that before. That's the Holy Spirit working in me. It's the Holy Spirit enlightening me, helping me to understand God's Word. And as I understand God's Word, I understand Him better. I get a greater understanding of who God is. But the natural man, the unbeliever, oftentimes will open Scripture and it makes no sense to them. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 2.14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Uh, once again, the natural man, the unregenerate man, the old man, the man with the old heart, can still understand the gospel of salvation. That is not hidden from anybody uh, but the deeper truths of Scripture are foolishness to, to the natural man. He cannot understand them without the, help, without the help of the Holy Spirit. Have you experienced that in your own life? You read the Bible and all of a sudden uh, God has just enlightened something to you and it really drives something home? That's the Holy Spirit at work. Well, let me give you another thing that the Holy Spirit uh, does in our lives as part of this new creature process. Uh, he gives us greater understanding of God's character. I'm learning, I think, I have the head knowledge of God and His holiness, but I don't think I really truly comprehend the holiness of God. And I think the more I think about it, the more uh, the Holy Spirit helps me to understand the holiness of God. I don't think anybody in here can truly grasp how holy God is. Isaiah, when he saw God in His holiness, just got a glimpse of it. He said, Woe is me, for I am undone. And he said, For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of, an un, of, uh, in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He understood, and he, he just caught just a small grasp of the holiness of God, and he was literally, uh, literally unraveled. I think if we really understood how holy God was, we would melt before His presence. 
And the Holy Spirit helps us to uh, get somewhat of a grasp of how holy God is. Because if we understand how holy He is, we understand that He must judge sin. And we understand if He must judge sin, that people must repent and turn to Jesus Christ in order to avert judgment upon themselves. That's the Holy Spirit at work. Gives us conviction, but it also gives us a hunger and thirst for the Word of God. Uh, I don't know about you, but I think that if I didn't have a hunger for God's Word, if I didn't have a thirst to know the Lord, I would have to question whether I even have the Holy Spirit. And I would even question my own salvation. Because I believe that every child of God, God through the Holy Spirit places that in them so that they have this innate hunger and thirst to know the Lord through His Word and through prayer and through fellowship with the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit does as part of this new creation process. Then thirdly, we find this in Romans, uh, Romans 6, 4. Romans 6, 4. The Bible says, Therefore, we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Well, do you know what separates us as Baptists from so many other religions, so many other uh, professions of faith? We have this thing we call baptism. Baptism doesn't wash away sins. Baptism is this. It's, it's like this ring I have on my finger. This ring says I'm married. It, it tells you, hopefully you understand that I'm married, uh, that I'm a faithful spouse to my wife, and she has one. But you know, if I take this ring off, I'm still married. If I put this ring on and I wasn't married, it wouldn't marry me. Well, baptism is the same. It's a symbol of what has happened in a person's life. A person comes through faith in Jesus Christ and they go through this process called baptism. It's a symbol of what has happened to them. Uh, as, a, as pastor lowers the person into the water, they identify with uh, the death of Christ. And as they're raised up out of the water, they identify with the raising of Jesus Christ from the grave. And so by obedience... It's a symbol of our identification with what Jesus Christ did for you and I. Well, some go through the waters of baptism and yet there's no change in their lives. I would dare say they really weren't saved to begin with. And they need to go back to square one and they, they need to examine their heart and determine do they really have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because if they do, then the Holy Spirit will affect that change in their lives. They will become that new creature. But as we go through baptism, uh, this symbol, this picture, is a picture of the idea that as a believer, we have a new master. Uh, now in the olden days in America, and, and even going back to, to the days of the Bible when slavery was practiced, uh, you know, a slave was a property of the owner, of the master. Uh, really wasn't much more than a possession. Uh, slaves could be bought, they could be sold just like a possession, and whoever they were sold to, they had to obey the new master. They had no choice. They were the slaves, and that was their master. They must obey. We have a new master. Well, you might say, well, I didn't have an old master. Well, yes, you did. Uh, you know what our new master, Jesus Christ, purchased us from? He purchased us from the slavery of sin. You see, every person who is walking today is a slave to somebody. Uh, they're either serving sin in their lives, they're a slave to sin. And, and by the way, that is a very cruel taskmaster, sin is. Uh, sin will do nothing but destroy the servant. The devil desires nothing more than to use people to abuse them and then throw them away. Uh, the devil may promise people wealth and fame and, and all these things, but at the end of the day, the devil will destroy men, women, and children. 
That is who Jesus Christ purchased us from. He redeemed us with His own blood. Well, does that mean that I'm now a slave to Christ? Absolutely. We, we are His slaves. We are bound to obey our Master in every sense of the word. Now the difference is, Christ is not a cruel Master. He doesn't crack a whip. He doesn't, uh, you know, at every drop of the hat that we make a mistake, He doesn't whip us. Though at times, uh, God may exercise chastisement in our lives. But our new Master is a loving Master. His desire is not to use us, to abuse us, and to throw us away. But it's to mold us and make us and love us and conform us into His will so that we can be all that He's meant us to be. Because after, after all, one day, uh, we're going to be just like Him. Uh, one day, we're going to be in His presence. And He is working to that end to make us that person. Uh, we were once slaves to sin and the flesh and the lust thereof, but now we're dead to sin. And we're alive to Christ. Uh, you know, the old master's still out there. Uh, he still beckons us, even as Christians. And at times, we may beckon the old master of sin, but we're not to abide there. We, we may make mistakes from time to time. I'm not excusing that, uh, that, that we sin and it's okay. That's wrong. But at times it happens. But we don't abide because we're dead to sin. Sin no longer has power over you and I. Uh, we have a Master now who has power over us and we must obey Him. Uh, we have a new walk with this new Master, part of this new life. Titus 2, 11-12 For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying a godliness and worldly, and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Um, part of this new walk is to walk soberly, righteously, and godly. Um, I've, I observe people walking. My wife will laugh because at times I'll make fun of the way people walk. Maybe we'll go to a shopping center and I'll just observe. I see people sometimes they just walk like this. Their arms aren't moving. And I think, how can somebody walk like that? And then you see people that just fling their arms all over the place while they're walking. And then you see people that just walk with their arms out. Everybody has a different walk. I just think it's fun. People probably laugh at me the way I walk. Some people walk with their feet out like this. Some people walk pigeon-toed. Everybody has a, a, you know, a way that they walk. You ever seen a drunk person walk? <laughs> they can't walk. And you know why they can't walk? Because they're under the influence of alcohol. Alcohol determines the way a drunk person walks. Well, you know what? We're to walk soberly. And to walk soberly is to walk by faith. In fact, on another occasion of the Bible, the Bible insinuates that we should be intoxicated by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit ought to control the way we walk. Because when we're controlled by the Holy Spirit, people are going to look at us and say, look at the way they're walking. They, there's something different about that person. You know, they don't walk like everybody else. You know what? That's being intoxicated by the Holy Spirit. That's letting the Holy Spirit guide and direct us and control the way we walk. Uh, we're to walk righteously and godly. Very simply put, to walk righteously and godly is to live a separated life. We're not to dress like the world. We're not to act like the world. We're not to talk like the world. We're not to entertain in the same desires as the world. We're to live a separated life. That's a command from Scripture. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That's part of this new life that's been promised to you and I. And then finally, uh, we have a new purpose as part of this new life. And we find this in Acts 9, verse 6. This is the, the account of uh, Saul before he became the Apostle Paul. You may remember the story how that Saul was persecuting the church and he, he went out to Damascus with letters from Jerusalem from the priest there 
and he was going to go to, to Damascus so that he could serve notice to the church and he was going to take Christians and bring them back to Jerusalem in handcuffs or whatever it is they use. He was going to bind them and take them back to Jerusalem. He was going to persecute the church. Uh, he had been known for killing Christians or at least consenting in their death. Uh, he had persecuted the church and even Jesus Christ Himself. And then He's on His road to Damascus in lo, a great light shone from heaven. That was Jesus Christ in His glory that Paul or Saul, he saw Jesus Christ in His glory. And he fell to his, his knees. He was blinded by the light. And notice what he says in Acts 9, verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Uh, you see this picture of baptism being raised to walk in newness of life comes with that very same question. Uh, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? We should have been asking that question uh, the day we got saved. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Now, for the Apostle Paul, uh, the answer didn't come easy. Paul talks on one occasion toward the end of his life how that he had been beaten, he had been stoned, he had been shipwrecked, he had uh, received 39 stripes, he had been flogged, he had been left for dead. And that was all because he asked God, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he followed the Lord's will for his life. Uh, as we ask that question tonight, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Don't expect the process to be easy. Sometimes it can be very, very difficult to exercise this new life that, that we're supposed to walk as Christians. Uh, but Paul did say toward the end of his life uh, that he had fought the fight, he had run the race, and he felt like he had done all that God had uh, asked him to do, and he left this world with that victorious mindset. Was it worth it for Paul? Absolutely. I think it was. Uh, the question we should be asking tonight is, Lord, what would thou have me to do? I mean, after all, we have a new life. We're a new person. God's given us a heart transplant. We have a job. We have something new that God's going to ask us to do. And we don't have to be old. We can be young and still ask that question, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And I believe that if we're honest with the Lord tonight, we fall short. I think that we could all, uh, we could all stand to ask that question, and then even ask it daily as we get up every morning, Lord, what will you have me to do today? And I believe we'd be surprised if we saw the doors that God opened for us. Uh, a new life, a new creature, and a new heart. I'll just close with that.